So um, you already started sharing this, but I want to come back to, because really the heart of this uh, particular podcast series um, is people, you know, rather than people sort of sharing their, their talking points as they do in their lectures and talks, whatever, which is all great stuff. Uh, I've been amazed at the quality of the folks that have been interested in having this conversation, but also really to provide a space for people to share their, their personal journey. How did you come to, again, you shared some of it in terms of the sudden death of, of uh, both David and your fiance, but, um, when did it begin to shift for you? When did you come to the awareness that um, perpetual progress was a myth? Was it gradual, sudden? And what was that like emotionally? So uh, share, uh, share a little bit of your, your trajectory, your life story, or your journey in terms of coming to grips with all this. Well, I'm, I'm smiling because the fact that we were just uh, violently interrupted by my father uh, unplugging the router <laughs> It's quite, quite, quite parallel to the fact that my, uh, my, my awakening was very much prompted by a, a sudden interruption by my father. <laughs> um, in that, uh, so over here in uh, England in 2000, we had quite a notable event, which was that um, uh, an, 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 a lot of truckers were upset. I think it was a change in fuel tax um, upset them. And so they decided to blockade the oil refineries in the UK uh, and also the uh, Dover-Calais connection between us and the rest of Europe. What year was this? 2000. Okay. I was at university at the time and uh, it was very, very striking how as soon as these, I think, six or seven refineries were blocked, everything ground to a halt. Um, there were, within a few days, there were no cars on the roads because everyone was panic buying petrol and storing it up. I was walking down the middle of a main road in York because there were no cars um, within days. Um, the supermarkets were running out of food because partly because everyone was panic buying food, partly because they had just-in-time delivery systems and none of, none of it could get there. Um, so this was a real, real eye-opener for me. Um, and around this time, I can't remember whether it was just before or just after that, uh, my dad emailed me and he'd been reading Colin Campbell's article in Scientific American about peak oil. Yes. Um, and Colin's a friend of mine now, but I'd never heard of him at the time. And yeah, that was a real, that was really the moment for me, 2000, when I suddenly went, wow, this whole society is quite fragile. And, and my dad was sending me these emails saying, you know, <laughs> he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a two hour conversation in his own right, my father, but, um, but he was sending me these emails saying, essentially, you know, just, you know, here's some information about what this Colin Campbell guy is saying. Um, thought I should let you know that the whole future that you were probably expecting to be having isn't going to happen. Um, actually, we're going to be descending into, you know, chaos and, and starvation and war. And just thought I should let you know. Have a nice day, Dad. Um, I'm sure my kids experience me kind of like that. <laughs> I've got a 36-year-old daughter, 34-year-old son, and a 29-year-old right. daughter. So the way you just articulated that is probably similar to them. <laughs> so yeah, just like our interview right now, I've, I've, uh, I, I've my, my, my smooth progress through life was rudely interrupted by my father. And, um, and to be honest, at the time, I thought, well, come on, you know, if it were that bad, it'd be all over the news. And you know, the, everyone would be talking about nothing else, and it can't be. Um, but I thought, well, I'll look into it, you know, just to set my dad's mind at rest, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. And uh, I'm still looking into it uh, <laughs> um, 20 years on. And, uh, and that was, uh, yeah, that was something I was sort of, after university, um, I took a job uh, initially doing sort of admin, but quite quickly worked my way up to running a a learning center for marginalized groups. So working with drug misusers and people with mental health problems and young asylum seekers. Uh, and I really loved that work, but in those, over those years, I was sort of doing more reading and research around this stuff. Um, it's funny you mentioned Paul Traferka because I remember reading his stuff way back then and die off the organ and everything. And, um, uh, and then, yeah, I got to a point where I thought, well, I love this work, but I'm basically helping people to reintegrate with society, but it seems like society itself is heading off a cliff and that feels like where I want to kind of 
put my energies. But I had no idea how. I had no peer group around this stuff. I had no connections. But you know, so what I did then was, and this has been the absolute key to my life since, was learn to live really cheaply. Um, you know, learn to live without rent or mortgage, a very nomadic lifestyle, perhaps a bit like yourself. Um, and that meant that I could, having saved some money while I was working, because uh, I've never been much of a spender, I um, decided to take some time off from work uh, and do some research and figure out how on earth to deal with this stuff. So this was like 2005. Um, and uh, yeah, did a lot of readings, reading things like Richard Heinberg's The Party's Over and yep. um, Endgame by Derek Jensen, I remember, was a big thing. Um, I, I, uh, Derek and I talked yesterday, I uh, had a wonderful right. conversation. And then in 2006, I heard about this course that was going to be run at a place called Schumacher College down in Devon over here. Um, and it was like, you know, obviously when you're doing a lot of reading and stuff, there are certain voices that you think, well, I really respect where this person's coming from. And it was like they were all teaching on this course. Um, and the one person teaching on the course who I'd never heard of was David Fleming. Um, and so I went along, Rob Hopkins was teaching there and he'd just moved to Totnes in Devon and basically was there sort of saying, oh, I've had this crazy transition idea. Like, do you think it, you know, could go anywhere? And uh, I remember sitting there with one of my fellow students on the course was a guy called Ben Brangwin, who was in quite a similar place. He'd sort of been in a quite conventional career, moving pixels around the screen, as he would say. And, um, and we were both sort of trying to figure out where to put our energies. And I remember him sort of nudging me and going, oh, this Rob guy, he's, he's got something about him. And, uh, and he put his hand up then and he said, hey, Rob, if you had, say, a couple of hundred grand to really ramp up this transition idea, what would you do with it? And Rob sort of looked back at him and went, why? Have you got a couple of hundred grand burning a hole in your pocket? Uh, and Ben said, well, no, I don't. But I sort of think I might be able to raise it for an idea like this. Um, and after the course, they went off and co-founded Transition Network together. Um, <laughs> And then David Fleming was teaching us, I think, the next day or the day after. And he was, among other things, he was the inventor of the kind of carbon rationing idea. Um, and so he was there talking to us about his, his sort of working out of how that could work in practice. And um, because I'd never heard of him before the course, I'd looked him up online. I'd read this little booklet that he had online called Energy and the Common Purpose. And, uh, and I had some questions. I thought, you know, his heart's in the right place, but this will never work. So... Um, so I kind of put my hand up and asked him these questions. He said, oh, these are very good questions. You've clearly thought about this, but they're a little outside the scope of this lesson. So maybe we should have lunch. Uh, and we had lunch. And then he said at the end of the first lunch, oh, we should have lunch tomorrow. So we had lunch again. Um, and uh, by the end of the second lunch, he convinced me that he had the answers to my questions. Um, and this is where I made probably the most cheeky move of my life. Um, but I turned to this guy must have been in his 60s and said look I read your booklet and it was great but it left me with these questions and you've got the answers to these questions but they're not in your booklet so other people are going to come up with the same answers the same questions also I don't think it's that well structured and I think I could probably you know improve it a bit <laughs> <laughs> and I just so to this day remember him looking me down and up this impertinent young man telling him that I could improve his life's work um, and uh, and to my eternal gratitude, he said, well, okay, you know, when you're done with this course, here's my card, look me up, um, we'll see what we can do. So I went and met him. Um, he gave me the word file of his booklet and said, show me what you can do, you know, come back when you've done something on it. So I did, sent it off to him. He invited me over to his little flat in Hampstead and, um, and yeah, said that he was impressed with what I did and let's work together on a second edition. And uh, um, you know, that might lead to us working together in future. It might just be a one-off thing. It might be a total disaster, but we'll see how it goes. And he had one condition, actually, on, uh, on our working together. I said, okay, what's that? He said, um, at least once a week, uh, we must go for a drink together at the local pub with no agenda whatsoever. Um, because as you'll know from his work, he's ever a fan of the informal and the importance of that. Yeah, uh, and he told, me that, he told me this story that I've never checked whether this is true or not, but apparently he told me that... Um, in Japan, when there's a, um, a, a board of a large company faces a huge decision like a takeover or something, 
Um, they'll sit around the boardroom table, they'll discuss it and they'll decide what they're going to do. But then they won't act on it that day. Instead, they'll park it till tomorrow and they'll all go out and get blind drunk together. And if it still seems like a good idea when they're all blind drunk, <laughs> then they'll act on it the next day. That's I, awesome. I have no idea whether this is actually what happens in Japan, but that's the story David told me as, as, um, as a, a symbol of how important it was that we just hang out and, and yes. informally get to know each other as people. And those lean drinks, as we called them, were just, I mean, some of the best experiences of my life. Yes. Stop. Um, and that, that was really the start for me in many ways, because then I had this incredible mentor who knew everybody, you know, like any time I'd, I'd, I'd be like, oh, David, I read this amazing article by such and such. She'd be like, oh, I'll ring her up. We'll have coffee. You know, <laughs> it was like, it just, you know, cause he'd been working on this for decades. Yes, and, of course. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so then I, I started to, you know, find a peer group basically, um, which felt like, Kind of finding an oasis in the desert and and to anyone else who's you know in a similar place of feeling sort of alone with the apocalypse like i would say you know that's the key thing is find the peer group like find other people who care like i mean now they're like resilience.org is a great website like go on resilience .org, start chatting to people find out who's local to you like but whatever your interests are like don't be just sitting there with the internet <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because it's it just is so hard and not conducive to the kind of um yeah the kind of interactions i mean there's a wonderful line from david's work actually he says um do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation wow do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation wow yeah. um and so yeah from there i mean i could tell a lot of stories from there but uh, from there i sort of found my found my peer group found my path uh, worked very closely with David, tried to get carbon rationing through the British government without success because basically it was seen as too much of a threat to economic growth is the short version. And then David Amoria died and then I threw myself into David's books and the land co-op and all the stuff that we've Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah. that's great. Thanks, Sean. Wow. Uh, it's interesting because uh, a part of me wants to just sort of go to a pub and hear some of those other stories uh not a part of the part, you know um but with respect to this this particular conversation it's interesting um one of the questions that connie originally formulated was related to um sort of the big picture uh, many but many of us have found thomas berry joanna macy brian swim others epic of evolution, big history, big green history, especially. I found uh, my enthusiasm for big history waned when I found that it was very techno-optimist, very human-centered, very linear understanding, rather than, as we were talking about much earlier, evolution as a branching tree that explores all sorts of personality, uh, 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 possibilities. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that if uh, this is one of the reasons why I found um, um, a more ecologically grounded interpretation of evolution to be essential that it takes humans out of the center of things that yeah. evolution isn't all about us and in fact our form of consciousness may actually be both a blessing and a detriment and it may actually be our own undoing um so i'm curious uh, one of the quotes that i love from joanna macy she says there is science now to construct the story of this journey that we've made on earth the story that connects us with all beings Right now, we need to remember that story, to harvest it and to taste it, for we are in a hard time, and it's the knowledge of the bigger story that's going to carry us through. So the question, have you found this epic of evolution or universe story helpful in a post-doom context, and have you delved into historical explorations of the rise and fall of civilizations and anything that you want to share about that? Yeah, where to begin with all of that? Wow. I think, funnily enough, the, the work that immediately comes to mind when I think about all that you've just said is, um, is the Tao Te Ching of all okay. things. Um, and the reason it comes to mind is not because it lays out some historical explanation, but because to my reading, it's all about the central importance of paradox in life. Um, the Tao Te Ching has this amazing way, you know, the sort of sacred text of, of Taoism, 
um, has this amazing way of holding two seemingly contradictory truths in tension and not trying to resolve that. Um, and that actually the, the, the wisdom is to be found in the dance between the two seemingly contradictory things rather than in resolving to one or the other. Right. Um, and I think I find that a lot with this question of our, you know, of the big picture story of, of history or indeed like with the conversations that I'm in the middle of at the moment around this humanity, not just the virus piece that I wrote. Um, that on the one hand, um, on the one hand, there's, um, there's maybe two, two points of view, one encapsulated by um, the saying that, you know, you didn't come into this world, you came out of it like a wave from the ocean, um, which, you know, I think you were talking about earlier. On the other hand, the idea that, you know, you know, you're not a human being that has spiritual experiences, you're a spiritual being having a human experience. And the, the meeting of those two perspectives between, you know, are we something spiritual having the experience of being something human and ecological ultimately? Are we something that ultimately is birthed out of ecology? For me, there's something profoundly true about both of those. Um, and it's not that we need to resolve one story down into the other. And actually, it really puts me in mind, maybe I should read actually a, a little bit from, from David's Lean Logic, because for me, that was, that was, um, that was a book that really reframed history for me, actually. Um, and there's a, there's a part, um, as you know, it's, it's, it's a, a, a dictionary for the future and how to survive it. And in the entry on ecology, or specifically ecology farmers and hunters. Um, he talks about, I don't know where to start, but he talks about um, the book of Genesis uh, and the story of Cain and Abel and the, uh, yeah, here we are. So we join the story in the second chapter. From the dust of the ground, Adama, God made Adam. Genesis 2 7. God planted the Garden of Eden, but warned that the fruit of the tree of knowledge was not to be eaten on pain of death. He made Eve from Adam's rib. Then in chapter 3, the serpent tempted Eve to eat the apple despite the prohibition. It was so good that she persuaded Adam to have one too. God, who had been walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, realized what had happened and came looking for them. He threw them out of the garden, placed angels with flaming swords at the entrance to make sure they stayed out and issued seven interesting curses. All of them have something to tell us, but curses four, five, and six have intense relevance to the transformation from hunting to agriculture, to mankind's new role as a farmer. And these are our seven curses. One, the serpent will crawl on its belly and be hated by human beings. Two, the woman will endure intense pain in childbirth. Three, the woman will yearn for her husband, but, he told Eve, he shall rule over thee. Four, the soil will be unproductive, full of thorn and thistles. Five, humankind must eat the herb of the field. Six, in order to get enough to eat, the man will endure intense hardship. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And seven, in death Adam will then return to the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. With Adam's two sons, Cain and Abel, in chapter four, we begin to see these curses at work. Cain is an agriculturalist. Abel has somehow escaped the curses and is a herder, that halfway stage from the life of the hunter-gatherer. They both make sacrifices to God. Abel offers a succulent lamb. Cain comes up with what sounds like a veggie box of rather middling quality. <laughs> God, evidently, prefers the lamb. That makes Cain jealous, and despite a short lecture from God needing, about needing a sense of responsibility towards his brother, Cain murders him. This is followed by God's new curse, this time on Cain. He will find the ground where he has murdered Abel to be unproductive. He is condemned to move on, to be a vagabond, 
to live in the land of Nod, the land of wandering. And now two things happen. One is that Cain turns out to be very successful as an agriculturalist, the founding father of a whole people, building the first city, Enoch, complete with musicians, craftsmen working copper and iron, and a population that will restlessly spread, wander far afield. The other is that Adam has a son, another son, whom he calls Seth, and his wife takes pains to explain what he represents. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Clearly, hostilities were to be permanent between the new order of agriculture and cities and the old order of pastoralists and hunter-gatherers. The new order would win every time, but the matter would never be settled, least of all in the mind. And that's the story. We know that actually the process of domesticating plants took place over millennia, and indeed that hunting for food, fish, game, and foraging is still practiced. But the shift from hunter-gathering to agriculture must have seemed sudden, and to many it undoubtedly was. The original hunter-gatherer population of Europe was practically wiped out, except in the areas such as northern Scandinavia, which were unsuitable for agriculture, in about the fifth millennium BC. The near liquidation of the indigenous Indians of North America took as little as two centuries. Wherever an agricultural people became established, their population would grow to the scale of the city and they would expand outwards, destroying the hunter-gatherers as they went. And now this city building, forest felling, ground-breaking, pastoralist murdering, serially cursed, crazily expansionist, energy addicted, water insatiable, ruthless family of Cain having won every other battle by foul means, has piously invented environmental ethics and wants to know how it can win with regard to the ecology. <laughs> he goes on, but, um, but that for me was a story. Yeah, that that's fabulous. Really, <laughs> I mean, yeah, read the rest of the entry, but um, it really, put into context both the religious story that you were telling before and that wider human story that we're both talking about. Um, and, and to be honest, I still don't feel like I've answered uh, the sort of implicit question there, which is why? Um, you know, like a lot of the indigenous cultures call it vetico, this, this disease that, that, we've, that we've got, this expansionist, cursed, pastoralist murdering, type of culture that David writes about, like why, given that the anthropological evidence is that the initial moves into agriculture weren't very good for our health and were quite difficult, um, why did we move from living in the garden, as you speak, to, to the, this way of life? And actually just today, off the back of that piece I've just published, I've been recommended a book, which maybe you know, called Nature and Madness by Paul Shepard, which I've not heard of before. Yes, Paul. She I learned about Paul Shepard through Dolores La Chapelle, uh, who uh, she wrote a book called Sacred Land, Sacred Sex, Rapture of the Deep, concerning deep ecology and celebrating life. Many of us still consider it, including David Abram, considers it probably the best book on deep ecology. She was an independent scholar, not unlike Teddy Goldsmith. And that book, Sacred Land, Sacred Sex, is to this day in my top 10 most important books I've ever read in my life. And she talks about how Taoism came into existence. It was so insightful. It was like, oh my God, it basically there was a regime change and um, uh, all of the Chinese literate intellectuals uh, were forced out of the city and spent, essentially spent over a hundred years philosophizing on the path of nature, the, the way of life, the way things really are, and that humans need to live in alignment, in harmony with that reality, with that way. Um, but she also introduced me to Paul Shepard and his whole understanding that there's a cultural um, insanity, really, that when we move out of healthy societies, living in a mutually enhancing relationship with primary reality, the living world, then we start seeing all kinds of mental and social dysfunctions. Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, uh, Nature and Madness, there's also a more recent one uh, that I believe his daughter helped him edit, um, a coming, uh, uh, something in the Pleistocene, coming of age in the place, I forget. But anyway, yes, Paul Shepard's awesome. Um, right. 
I was just well, checking know, this, the bibliography of Lean Logic to see whether David had him in there, but he doesn't. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this actually leads into the other question that uh, one of the other questions that I've been asking the the participants in this series mm. is re related to restoring the past. Mm. That many of us have had to restore the past as well as our sense of the future, um, and I wonder if you have any if onlys. Like if only we had done X by this time, or if only our species hadn't taken this turn or, you know, whatever. I mean, if only we hadn't invented agriculture or, you know, whatever. Um, or has your reinterpretation of the past sort of moved along more lines of inevitability? Hmm. I mean, inevitability is a complex concept in itself. Um, I'm one of, one of the things that's always fascinated me is the sort of free will determinism debate, um, which, uh, well, I suppose I quite like Spinoza's take on it, which is that we've just misconceived both concepts and that you're, in a sense, everything we do is determined by something, but you're more free the more you understand what you're determined by and, you know, choose it. Yeah. yeah. That kind of integration. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in a, no, I don't think it's inevitable in the sense that I think there were other choices that could have been made. Yes, I think it's inevitable in the sense that no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. So again, it's one of these sure. inherent paradoxes that I don't think is for resolving. I think it's one of those that is for holding um, in paradox. Uh, in terms of if onlys, I mean, given what I've just said, in a sense, if onlys, hmm, actually, it reminds me of something that same very wise friend told me after uh after maria died which was that uh if only is not your friend <laughs> that you know you can just go down that rabbit hole of like oh if this or that had happened then you know maybe they'd still be alive or maybe and it's just not a useful way to spend your energy and especially in that grieving context it's so tempting um to to fall into that if only thing um so you know i could i could name a hundred things that i you know, if I could, if I could go back in time and and be there and make different choices on behalf of humanity, I probably would, but I can't, so I don't really want to waste my energy there. Yeah, no, um, I, 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 I honor that and I'll align with it myself. My, my take is that beliefs are not for mapping reality. Beliefs are for molding behavior, and that uh, so I have a number of beliefs that I don't hold as necessarily ontologically true, but I do hold as profoundly useful. You yeah. touched on one earlier, this, this idea that we were chosen by the universe or that we chose ourselves to be alive at this time. Who the hell knows whether that's true or not? And it, you know, but it's a really useful belief. It's, it's yummy and it helps me live a better life if I have this sense that uh, I was made for these times, that the universe in some sense chose for me or that I chose myself to be born at this time. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, as long as it's held with humility, I think. Exactly. Rather, you know, exactly. Here, here, I, here I am, you know, the savior has arrived, people. <laughs> I can do no wrong. That's probably a less helpful story. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think of those things, I think, as stories um, rather than necessarily beliefs. They're, they're kind of narratives for making sense of the world, as you say. And there's that, you mentioned John Michael Greer earlier, and I remember a piece he wrote several years ago that always stuck with me. And I, I think he said it came to him in a dream. Um, this, this line, um, knowing no stories is ignorance. Knowing many stories is wisdom. Knowing one story is death. Yes, yes. And, you know, that so encapsulates where we're at, is that, you know, if, if all we have to make sense of the world is the story of this civilization and its glorious progression towards conquering the stars, then we're completely in a dire old mess because that story isn't leading us where it says it is. Um, and, I mean, I'm, I'm always very struck by how we have all these um, sayings in our culture and quite often they seem to contradict each other. Like on the one hand, you've got uh, many hands make light work. And on the other hand, you've got too many cooks spoil the broth. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to do then? Do I want more people or fewer people? You know, what, what, what? But actually over time you realize that that's good. Like having a diversity of stories is good because it means you can choose the one that's applicable to your present circumstance. Like maybe in this circumstance, actually we've got too many hands and we need to reduce. Maybe in this circumstance, we need some help. And so holding that diversity of possible stories is, as John Michael Greer's dream told him, is, is wisdom. Um, and so much of my work, I think, is about offering alternate narratives 
um, to our present society so that as the present dominant belief system becomes harder and harder to reconcile with reality and mm -hmm. the, the burden of denial becomes heavier and heavier to maintain belief in that, then if there's something alternative to grab hold of instead that actually makes a lot more sense and is far more useful in our present circumstance, then I think that is a, a kind of crucial, a crucial cultural service um, that we can offer in, in, in moments where, yeah, where the dominant story is crumbling. Yeah, yeah. No, I found that that, that particular essay, I mean, I, I, I love so much of John Michael Greer's writing. So I think I've audio recorded uh, seven or eight of his books and um, just unofficially, they're all available on SoundCloud. Um, but also um, his blog posts. I mean, I think I've recorded over 400 of his blog posts on the Archdruid Report. And his, just for anybody listening to this conversation, um, his book, Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush, the best of the Archdruid Report is a collection of some of his best essays that didn't make it into some of his other books. And I think chapter four or five is this one that you're now referring to, which is that knowing, you know, knowing more. I, don't know, than... I, I read it as a blog years ago. I don't know which chapter of the yes. collection it's in, but. Right, right, right. Exactly. Well, uh, Sean, I want to now move into what you touched on earlier, but I really want to go a little deeper in terms of impermanence and death. Many of us have found that a sacred, meaningful, inspiring approach to impermanence and death has really helped us to have equanimity and um, resolve, but, uh, but hope that's grounded in where we can make a difference, not hope for things that are actually going to further the problems around this understanding of impermanence and death, holding that in a sacred way. And I'm, I'm just wondering, both with the sudden death of your fiance and, and David within a, such a short time of each other, but just more in general, how do you hold impermanence and death and has that assisted you in sort of this post doom consciousness? Hmm. Yeah, massively. Um, well, again, I think I need to open with a reading from David on this one because, okay. uh, because death is one of my all time favorite entries in the dictionary. Uh, and it's a short one, so I shall read it in full. Okay, great. By the way, anybody listening to this, I, I cannot recommend too highly Lean Logic, uh, a dictionary uh, for uh, surviving the future. And um, uh, these entries are all cross-referenced, and you you just follow your heart. Open it up. It's sort of the flip and dip method. Just open it up. Yeah. Pick, Put your finger down, read something, and then find where you want to go from there, and you can have you can have a feast. It's a, almost like a devotional. You can yeah, yeah, it. it's like a, it's like a choose your own adventure book. Sometimes think that David pre-invented Wikipedia because, of course, he was writing this decades ago. <laughs> so I ran a course at Schumacher College a couple of years ago based around David's work, and one of the students on that course has gone and built an online version of Lean Logic. Oh, uh, which, really? Um, yeah, which we're going to be launching in a in a couple of months alongside the film that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, and for those who are interested in the books, there's also this paperback, Surviving the Future, Culture, Carnival, and Capital in the Aftermath of the Market Economy, which is sort of choosing one of those pathways through, as Michael mentioned earlier, and turning it into a conventional front-to-back narrative, what I sometimes call a gateway drug into David's thinking, because once you get hooked on that, you, you want the full, the full <laughs> magic of the holistic dictionary. Amen. Um, but yes, death. So this is, this is the entry on, uh, on death. Death, the means by which an ecosystem keeps itself alive, selects its fittest, controls its scale, gives peace to the tormented, enables young life, and accumulates a grammar of inherited meaning as generations change places. A natural system lies in tension between life and death. Death is as important to it as life. A lot of death, is a sign of a healthy, large population. Too much death is a sign that it is in danger. It is not coping. Its terms of coexistence with its habitat are breaking down. Too little death is a sign of the population exploding to levels which will destroy it and the ecology that supports it. No death means that the system is already dead. The reduction of life to an icon the assertion that life, usually human life, is sacred, 
disconnects the mind from the ecosystem to which it belongs. It is a fertile error. Beneath the exaggerated regard for life lies an impatience with, a disdain for, the actual processes that sustain the ecology that sustains us. Expressing faith in the sanctity of human life is a license in a series of little, well-intentioned, self-evident steps to kill the ecology that supports it. The large-scale system, relying on its size and technology, and making an enemy of death which should be its friend, joins a battle which it cannot win. In systems thinking, death is sacred. That is so fabulous. I mean, that's that uh, I use the word in a non otherworldly sense that I experience as scripture. That is so inspired, so right on. Um, I'm reminded Loyal Rue, who's a philosopher of religion and, and a dear friend and colleague of ours, he talks about death being the entrance, death is the entrance fee paid on exiting. Uh, <laughs> it's good. Uh, but I love the ecological grounding of that of that experience. So thank you for sharing that. That was perfect. Mm, no, it's really, as I say, it's one of the entries that um, that I personally find quite moving. And of course, for me personally, uh, I discovered that entry in David's manuscript whilst trying to come to terms with David's own death. Wow. wow. <laughs> um, and and it was helpful um i mean you know i mentioned those incredible conversations that david and i would have down at the uh white bear i think the local pub was called in hampstead and um and how they genuinely were among the, the most valued experiences of my life and most delightful and of course because lean logic is in this very unusual structure i mean it's such a um an authentic replication of David's mind, <laughs> um, the the unexpected connections that he would draw between um, between seemingly unrelated things, um, and so yeah, reading that in the aftermath of his death, and indeed Maria's death, I it, it really helped. It really helped to to remember what death is. Um, in that ecological context um, yeah. and and that it has its place that i mean it's it actually now reminds me of another conversation i had with with jonathan porritt who is david's lifelong friend um and i was saying to him one time that sort of slightly bashfully saying you know i sort of think that lean logic's probably better now than it would have been if david hadn't died because you know i i've been able to sort of edit it, <laughs> you know, like actually do some work on it. And Jonathan burst out laughing and he said, John, of course it's better. It still wouldn't be published if David yes, exactly. <laughs> Which I'm sure is absolutely true. And it's only occurring to me now that when David writes about, um, you know, deaths making space for future generations and allowing the passing on of wisdom that, um, yeah, it hadn't really occurred to me quite how pertinent that, <laughs> that actually is. Um, and, uh, and so, as I mentioned, um, the process of, 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 of grieving for me on a personal level, um, I think brought me a lot that really helped with my, my grieving on, a, on an ecological level. Um, and also, you know, helps with regard to, to one's own impermanence, to my own, you know, impending death at some point in the coming decades. Um, and the fact of, you know, if we hold that awareness of, of our own impermanence in this form at least then again I, I mean i always come back to this it comes down to well what do we want to do while we're here you know like oh if if i if i'm asked like what's the meaning of life that's the best answer i've got to to tell a story with your life that you're completely thoroughly authentically proud to tell honestly um and that you sort of look back on and smile or laugh <laughs> yeah. and and uh and that, you know, as I say, there's nothing in these times that stops us, stops us doing that. But somehow looking death square in the face really helps us to do that. Um, because it's, it's, as I say, it's honesty and it's joy that are the most amazing guides that I've found. And 
grief is actually the pathway to joy um because if we're if we're suffering loss whether it's whether it's loss of a loved one whether it's loss of a future whether it's loss of a story whether it's fear of losses to come that loss shuts us down and grief is the process by which we come back to life and the process by which we rediscover joy and death is central to that yeah amen well said wow okay so uh last question um uh, in coming to terms with the cascading problems of overshoot, resource depletion, uh, climate breakdown, and so forth, have you encountered stages of grieving that went beyond mere acceptance, like what Paul Traferka talked about as finding the gift, and then what opened up for you positively on the other side? So you've already touched on this, but just any sort of um, concluding remarks along this notion of dark optimism post-doom around finding the gift in these times where not only are we in collapse, in contraction, <clears throat> um, but that we are looking at the possible extinction of our species in the not too distant future. I mean, our species will go extinct at some point, but it, it could be in the not too distant future. So how do you hold that in terms of finding the gift? Yeah, the one thing that we've touched on that I feel maybe calls to say something slightly more about it is what you were saying about um, adopting a wider sense of self um, because you know things are often framed in this you know selfishness versus selflessness thing that you know if we're if we're environmentally aware then we again, sort of sacrifice our selfish desires for a, for a wider good kind of thing. Um, but as you were saying, and as Joanna Macy says, and as many people say, um, once we cease to see our identity as being Sean, um, <laughs> or, or whoever. Um, Skin encapsulated ego is the way that- uh, As Alan Watts put it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Once we get beyond that, then, I mean, I suppose for me, like being, selfish in the conventional sense was really unsatisfying you know to, to sit and I don't know consume and watch box sets or whatever the standard path that's held out for us as, as selfish consuming is like that was really hard for me when I was becoming aware of the scale of suffering in the world um, you know it, it just it, it just wasn't very satisfying it left me with this huge rift in myself between this pain about what was happening and the fact that I wasn't acting on it because I think you know if you if you if you know something but you don't act on it then you don't really know it you don't really know it in an integrated sense and so the only way that I could become more comfortable um with what's unfolding on our planet was to engage with it in some meaningful way and I didn't know what that way was but actually even the process of trying to figure out what a way might be yeah. led to me feeling more alive and again, like if there was one piece of advice I would give, it would be like, follow that, that sense of, you know, what opens you up, what feels like joy, what feels like integration, what feels like getting rid of cognitive dissonance in yourself. Um, because the more I follow that feeling, the more it leads me to, yeah, to joy and to aliveness and to actually making contributions, which people then feed back to me are really valuable. Whereas if I were trying to, I don't know, follow the, the narratives that are laid out and earn a bunch of money and become quote financially independent and all of that i'm quite sure i wouldn't feel nearly as satisfied with the story of my life as i do by listening to these tiny little voices in the heart or spirit that that just whisper yeah there's something there that's not quite right or that you need to look at more closely or um and yeah as i've done that um i've learned more and more about how as you say, how, how overwhelming the times we're living in are in terms of what's unfolding, how awful that is. But I've also found far more joy in exploring that than I would have done in, in keeping my head down and, and trying to ignore it all. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we touched on a lot of that before, but, um, but yeah, that wider sense of who am I, I think is really, really key to being happy, actually, being happy in these times, because 
there's nothing about these times that stops us from living good lives. Nothing. Yes. Amen. Amen. Wow, Sean, this is just so awesome. Um, <laughs> I, I, will, I will make you this promise, and this is easy to make because it's just effortless, that this afternoon when Connie and I go for our walk among the Redwoods here in Eureka County, <laughs> Humboldt County, um, I will hug a really big, gorgeous one and I will channel <laughs> your heart, brother. Oh, I'm so touched. I'm, I'm so touched. This is, this, is, this is a closing of a circle from, as I say, 2002 when I swore off flying. And I've flown once since for a, for a family medical emergency, which I have no regrets about at all. Um, and yeah, this is beautiful. This is joining me back to that moment 17 years ago when I decided, you know what, I'm not going to fly. And right now, I'm finding the way that I can be there through you, because if we're all one, then there I am. Yeah, no, it, it will be a profound experience for me to have that experience and just channel or bring you present in my imagination. So thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm tingling. I'm literally tingling. Thank you, Michael.